you shall be happy. Chapter 12, verse 7. That there is a biblical law to be happy is what has shaped my entire approach to happiness. Dude, that this is great. Be happy. <laughs> man, I'm just really feeling, feeling depressed, man. Well, according to the Bible, don't. Thanks, God. It is a moral obligation, not just an emotional state. <laughs> We owe being, or at least acting, happy to everyone in our lives, and yes, even to God. This is great. So now not only is uh, is God's advice just don't be depressed, now when you're depressed, you're actually sinning because you're going against God. Hey, all you depressed people out there, as if you don't already feel worse enough or, or miserable enough in this life, be happy or else God will send you to hell. I like to engage in a little bit of self-harm and review Prager Yo. Although I've made the joke before, I will make it again because it's a very true joke. But uh, Prager U obviously is short for Prager University. They're not a real university, but uh, they identify as a university. Okay. So this is called Deuteronomy. Why it's hard to love God. Why is it hard to love God? Perhaps it's because God has not made himself known in any meaningful way. Perhaps, uh, I know for me personally, it had something to do with me having severe anxiety and, and OCD and depression and all this shit and, uh, you know, reaching out to God repeatedly only to be left in the dust, which eventually had me thinking, what does it even mean to love somebody, right? Part of loving another person or loving someone means being there for them when they need you. And, uh, you know, that never really, God, unfortunately, uh, he, he missed the mark on that one. He was the absent father. And uh, yeah, now PragerU is going to explain to us why it's actually hard for us to love God. I'm sure it's going to be something very stupid. I don't know yet. Buckle in, get your fedoras ready, and let's go. The only way to become a good person or to make a better society is by studying goodness. Many people think all And you then he's going to say, what is goodness? It is according to the Bible. And then you have to ask, well, how do you determine that the Bible is good if you don't already have some kind of a point of reference of goodness? Because a lot of people, they don't want to say it, but goodness to them actually is derivative of whether or not this thing results in the betterment of human well-being or the worsening of human well-being. Even the people that argue like, well, gays shouldn't be real because God... They ultimately think that if gay people weren't around, that society would be better and that the world would be a better place. That is ultimately where people oftentimes derive their morality from. I'm just not too much of a fucking cuck to say it, but these people are. Need to do good or be good is to have good intentions. But you can no more be good without studying how to be good than you can play piano without studying how to play piano or practice medicine without studying medicine. So really quickly, you don't need to have good intentions in order to be good or do good. Even the Bible itself contradicts this claim because Paul said himself that he doesn't even care if somebody is sharing the gospel with selfish intent. If their intentions behind preaching and sharing the gospel is just to uh, garner attention or fame for themselves, Paul said that doesn't even matter because the gospel is still being shared. Intentions actually, I mean, they are relevant, yes, but intentions do not determine whether or not the thing you are doing is good. There's a word for the study of goodness and how to make a good world. God, the Bible. Wisdom. Jesus. Unfortunately, however, for much of the last century, few schools and even few parents have taught wisdom. Uh -oh. The result is moral chaos. Yep. They always say this. They always say like the, the, the moral chaos, guys. I, I hate to break it to you, but actually we live in the best world yet. I don't want to say the best world, but as far as America and, and the parameters set there, the way that we apprehend criminals, the rules that we have set in place, the freedoms that we enjoy, we are in one of the best places we could be yet. So they love to have the whole moral chaos talking point, but it really falls flat when you realize that things used to be so much worse back then. Even the Bible. Hasn't the Bible talked about people that have slept with animals and all kinds of depraved behavior? I mean, 
moral chaos, quote unquote, is not exactly a new phenomenon. Western civilization, the civilization that has been the most successful in history in making good societies comes from the Bible. That's why the Bible yep. is the most influential book ever written. So I'll share with you some of the wisdom from just one book of the Bible, <laughs> the fifth, Deuteronomy. So first and foremost, when he says that, what he's doing is is he's using or he's engaged in a uh, confusion of correlation and causation. So he's going to say something like America is one of the best societies, right? And he's saying that's thanks to the Bible. No, actually, it's thanks to the Constitution. It's thanks to the fact that the founders of this country prioritized secularism and not religiosity. The founders of America weren't even Christian or Judeo-Christians. They were theists. So... Were a lot of people Christian at the time? Yes. Was it because they were Christian that America became such a great society? No. One, do not show partiality in judgment. Chapter one, verse 17. A compassionate society is built on justice, not compassion. That might sound counterintuitive, but while we should be compassionate in our private lives, the state must be preoccupied with justice. I wonder what Dennis Prager's thoughts were with the George Floyd death. Hmm. That is the reason for this law. Judges are forbidden not only to show favor to the rich, but also to the poor. The purpose of a judge is to dispense justice. Yeah, but okay, the judge might not need to, but you realize part of the problem is if you're poor, you get a public defender who's paid nothing, who is usually very shitty and is also bogged down by a million different cases that they all have to deal with. Whereas if you're rich, you can pay for the best lawyer, the best defense imaginable. So sure, maybe the judge himself or herself isn't allowed to be biased against or towards a certain groups of people, but biases can still exist due to the ability to hire a better legal defense team. The whole like, don't show partiality that was in the constitution do you think that they were like scrolling through deuteronomy and were like oh well this looks like a good one why don't we stick this one here in the, the in our new our new good old society no we can observe and appreciate the fact that bias is not allowed it is forbidden when it, we're talking about the criminal justice system even though bias and subconscious bias still exist to a heavy degree if we want to compare black people to white people and who gets sentenced to death more often for example um we can appreciate that but that comes from the constitution you don't need the bible to recognize that justice should be impartial in fact there is again better arguments to be made without using the bible and these people do this a lot they say because the Bible says don't be partial, or look, the Bible says don't be biased. Okay, why? Your answer would be because the Bible. My answer would be you don't want to be biased because everybody here in this country has a right to innocence until proven guilty. And if you have bias in the criminal justice system, then that's not true justice. Then you're not actually enacting justice. You're not actually holding criminals accountable. Because now suddenly bias could exist uh, based on skin color or wealth or degree or there are biases that could exist. And if they do, it would uproot the very concept of justice. Notice how I'm able to explain this and give an answer without citing the Bible. Dennis Prager would be forced to say, uh, cause my Bible. Two, do not be afraid of anyone. Also chapter one, verse 17. Then why are the conservatives, along with PragerU, so perpetually afraid of liberals, Marxists, trans people? Every human being has fears. The question is, whom do we fear? And for most well, I fear you. people, <laughs> only if you fear God will you not fear men. Pastor Dietrich Bonhoeffer, <laughs> one of the few Germans to actively oppose the Nazi regime What's and who was executed for doing so feared God more than Hitler. If more... Okay. This doesn't really help your point because he was killed. <laughs> I fear no man. I fear only God. And now he's dead. Executed. Ki killed. Murdered. What is this proving? <laughs> if you fear God more than men, you'll die. Okay? That's... 
Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Christ. More Germans had feared God more than they feared Hitler. And if more Russians had feared God more than they feared Stalin, tens of millions of people would not have been murdered. But Three. you just gave me an example of people that were murdered because they feared God. You will find him if you seek him. Chapter 4, verse 29. Funny how I spent my entire upbringing seeking God, and millions of other people have as well, and then God just never shows up. It's really weird, you know? Just as finding a spouse can take years of searching, so too finding God can take years of searching. But why? Because you're telling me, or according to your religion anyway, God sends me to hell if I fail to find him. Why is God playing hide and seek, but if I lose, I get cast into eternal torment? It shouldn't take years of searching to find God, Dennis. God should be obvious and known, and the choice as to whether or not we want to follow him should be ours. Okay, yeah, you know what? He's right. I I'll have to go back to the local 7-Eleven and check the cigarette aisle. Maybe God is still there. Like a good spouse, the effort is worth it. Without God, life has no ultimate, no objective meaning. If there's no God, every one of us is as insignificant as a grain of sand. It's no, why do they always do this? Why do they say nobody has objective meaning? One, who, literally, who here has objective meaning? We have all chosen our meaning in life. Even Prager you, Dennis Prager here, has chosen his meaning. Now, he may have been influenced as to, uh, or, or he may have been influenced by what he read in the Bible as to what choice he wants to make for his purpose. However, we don't have an objective purpose. There, there is no such thing. All of our purposes are subjective. We choose our own purpose. We set our own path, which, mind you, is far more freeing. If God is going to give us an objective purpose, do we even have freedom? What's the point of even having freedom in the country at that point? Because I have a purpose that I must abide by because God. Where's my freedom? Where's my choice? Where's my free will? Yeah, nobody has objective purpose, Dennis, you dumb fuck. Second of all, they always say, without God, everybody's insignificant. What are you talking about? First of all, millions of people have been slaughtered and massacred throughout the ages in the name of God. So plenty of people have believed in God and have still seen other humans as insignificant. In fact, God himself has seen other people as insignificant, considering he commanded King Saul to massacre that one village, where he also deliberately said to kill babies who were still nursing from their mothers. Second of all, I don't need God to demonstrate why we are worth something. We share a society. We share a space. Living in a society in which people are disregarded and seen as nothing, so they are killed or disregarded or abused by the law, creates a worse society. That hurts me. That hurts the people I love and the people I care about. Even more so, I myself have value because I view myself as valuable. People I know and love have value because I love them. I value them and they value me. It's a mutual exchange of respect and the recognition that we share a society and a space, and if we were to behave in a way where we viewed humans as worthless and, and, and disregarded their needs completely, like what Republicans want to do, then we also recognize that that would make all of society worse, and that would hurt me. That would hurt the people I care about as well. We don't need God for any of this. Life has no ultimate, no objective meaning. If there's no God, every one of us is as insignificant as a grain of sand. This is also really creepy, too, because it, it it's like, it reveals what Christians think. They're like, if I didn't believe in God, then I would just see all humans as uh, just a grain of sand. They're just insignificant. You know, I'd squash them like a bug. Maybe even do another holocaust. You know, who cares? Thankfully, God, though. Hmm. Psalm 14.1, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none that does good. Thank you, Elijah. I would like to send you my own book. It's called The Bible of Hunter Avalon. And it says on the last page, only morons refuse that Hunter Avalon is God. Checkmate, buddy. All right. My Bible, The Bible of Hunter Avalon, deliberately has a verse that says, if you don't think that Hunter Avalon is God, then you are dumb. Checkmate. What are you going to do now? The Bible has a verse in which it says, if you don't believe the Bible, then you are dumb. <gasps> wow. It's not a coincidence that as fewer Americans take God and religion seriously, suicide and depression rates have risen dramatically. 
I wonder if there's something to do with social media, the more brutal capitalism in which people need to work and struggle just to get by consistently, the fact that stress is growing because of inflation, but wages are not uh, matching or rising accordingly to inflation? I wonder if any of that has anything to do with this, Dennis, or do you think that if we all just got down on our knees and started throat sucking God off, that all of a sudden everything would get better? You're just delusional. You're literally like, if people believed in my fairy tale, they'd all be happy. Huh. This is no better than the dumb fucks that say, well, if we were all God-fearing, loving Christians, there would be less school shootings. Okay, then how come when you look throughout the 80s into the early 2000s, there, there was an increase in Americans who prioritized and strongly believed in God, and there was also an increase in school shootings during that time. You have no idea what you're talking about, Dennis Prager. You are making stuff up. Four, you shall have no other gods before me. Chapter five, verse seven. We have more gods in modern life than idol worshipers had in the ancient world. Wow. <laughs> Wait, what are, what are some of the gods? Money? <laughs> PhD? <laughs> you are worshiping your degree. This is what I mean, by the way, okay? See how they're saying, like, money is a god, which is bad. A PhD is is god, so that's bad. They're obviously getting at science by showing the, the vial here and DNA. That's, that's a god, which is bad. This is what I mean with Christians who are so caught up in this sham that there's going to be some magical afterlife where they all get to float around the clouds with Sky Daddy that they just disregard the current life, the current life that we all are living, the only life that we know for certain we have. They just disregard that, you know? To, to Dennis Prager and other chuckle fucks, who cares about money? Be poor, live your entire life suffering, starving, desperate, because heaven awaits. Who cares about getting a degree and making it in life? Who cares about having a, a consistent job and a, a, a consistent income to support your family? Because heaven awaits. Like, they just don't even give a fuck about people who are in this life, struggling now, or need these things to get by, or how these things have made life better, because they're so preoccupied with, oh, but, but heaven, you know? We don't know if there's a heaven. We don't know if there's a hell. Nobody can know that. But we do know that we live this life, and we know that we have this life, so we should focus on making this life, that we know we have for certain, better. One of a dozen examples. Many secular people believe in science the way religious people believe in God and the Bible. <laughs> I love it. This is my favorite cope. This is my favorite one of them all, dude. The secular people, they worship science. Every Sunday, they go to the scientific museum where they bow at the pews and reclaim their allegiance to the sciences. No, actually, a lot of secular people prioritize science because science gives us something, and it's crazy. I know Christians, they, they never have this or have understood this concept, apparently. But science actually gives us evidence as to why we believe certain things. Science provides us with experimentation, data, and conclusions that can usual, uh, usually or ideally be replicated and also be used to make predictions. Science provides us with the best possible explanation of our natural world. And it's because of science that the world we live in now is the best it's been yet. And it's because science follows evidence. With religious people, it's dogmatic. It's the Bible says so, so I follow the Bible. They don't have evidence. Believe me, I've talked to many, many Christians on that one, okay? None of them have, have adequately provided me with evidence of Christianity or of God because they don't have evidence because Christianity is, by definition, faith-based, which, like I've already said, is irrational because you have put your complete and full confidence and trust, which is what faith means, in this religious text, in this idea that a man once rose from the dead and he walked on water and there was a snake that talked, you've put your faith, complete confidence in this, despite there being no evidence. Science, we look at and appreciate science and trust science because of the evidence. These are polar opposites, Dennis, and I know you guys think it's really cute, to say, well, the secularists worship science the same way that... No, we don't. And if they do, they would be dumb. 
Dogma, in general, is stupid, but it's religious people that require the dogmatic belief in order to reinstate the faith. Since it's based on faith, it also needs to be dogmatic. This is why questioning is oftentimes looked down upon. When you start critically analyzing what you believe, you are stepping out of faith. You're breaking away from the dogma, and that's a no-no to Christians or to Christianity in general. There's a big problem with that. Unlike God and the Bible, science has nothing, simply nothing, to say about good and evil or about the meaning of life. So it's partially correct here that, yes, science does not tell us what is good and what is evil. It also does not give us the meaning of life. Uh, but neither does the Bible. Because if we were to follow the Bible, then we would be considering slavery good because that's what God himself said in the Old Testament. If we were to follow the Bible, then we would think the meaning of life was to just live our lives uh, submitting to some deity that can't even be proven. So, no, science doesn't give us answers on the meaning of life or good and evil, but it can provide a point of reference. So, because we know, according to science, that uh, certain societal expectations placed on men are harmful to the mental well-being of men, we now can understand, or we as humans can determine that, I know that reiterating this bad societal standard hurts people, it hurts men, so by doing so, that is not good. Now, that's not science that told me it's not good, but because of the scientific understanding of how these expectations affect people mentally, we can then determine from there whether or not it is good or bad to engage in those societal standards. Five. Love God with all your heart. Oh, Chapter great. 6, verse 5. Given all the unfair suffering in the world, it's difficult for many people to love God. I admit, I am one of them. God knows this love is difficult. That's why Deuteronomy commands us to love him. It's an amazing commandment, and it's amazing in another way. Deuteronomy is the first book in history to present a God who loves human beings and who wants human beings to love him. Right off the bat, really quite yikesy that God commands us to love him. You realize that if you love somebody because you've been commanded to, that it's not really love? Like, do you think if I went up to my wife and held her at gunpoint and was like, love me, bitch, when she starts telling me that she loves me and she's going to devote her life to me, that she genuinely loves me? If you're commanded to love somebody and then you love them because of that command, you are not actually loving anybody. That's not what love looks like. Even more so, it's it's with God anyway. Hey, I'm commanding you to love me, and if you don't, then I'm going to cast you into the pit of hell. <laughs> That's some love. Furthermore, you say God wants us to know him, then why has he failed to reveal himself in any meaningful way? Repeat them again and again to your children. Chapter 6, Interesting. Verse seven. So, brainwash kids. That's what you're saying right now. You realize that if you are repeating something over and over again to your children and you refuse to let them question it, that is the textbook definition of indoctrination because indoctrination is not teaching something to children. Indoctrination is teaching something to someone or a group of people uncritically. That's what makes it indoctrination. So repeating this stuff over and over again to your kids without question is literally the textbook definition of indoctrination. And uh, keep in mind that if this were the same exact advice given, like, remember to teach your kids that it's okay to be gay and that gay people are real, uh, all of the right wing, Tucker Carlson and Dennis Prager, would go into a diabetic coma, seething about how it's actually grooming. Parents need to teach their children wisdom and moral values all the time. In the words of Deuteronomy, talk about them when you're at home and when you're on the road and when you go to bed. And when you get up, otherwise others, such as morally confused teachers and social media, will teach your children neither wisdom nor good values. Always? So it's like, hey kids, sit down. Oh, are we going to have movie time? We're going to talk about wisdom, Johnny. The wise man builds his house upon a rock. The poor man, or the dumb man, builds his house upon the sand. Daddy, where's the evidence for, for the Bible being true? How dare you question me, Timmy, okay? I have built my house upon the sand because I have no evidence to support my claim. What are you going to talk about, dude? On the way to school, 
Like, we're going to pick up groceries. By the way, have I told you that story in the Bible about the time that God killed the infants? It's a, it's a real classic, Timmy. Verse 7, you shall be happy. Chapter 12, verse 7, that there is a biblical law to be happy is what has shaped my entire approach to happiness. Dude, that this is great. Be happy. <laughs> man, I'm just really feeling, feeling depressed, man. Well, according to the Bible, don't. Thanks, God. It is a moral obligation, not just an emotional state. What? We owe being or at least <laughs> acting happy to everyone in our lives. And yes, even to God. This is great. So now not only is, uh, is God's advice just don't be depressed. Now when you're depressed, you're actually sinning because you're going against God. Hey, all you depressed people out there, as if you don't already feel worse enough or, or miserable enough in this life, be happy or else God will send you to hell. Because no one makes the case for atheism more persuasively than unhappy religious people. Deuteronomy is filled with life-enriching insights like these. I explained them in depth in the Rational Bible, my commentary on the first five books of the Bible. Those books are the best antidote to one. Ew, we don't care about your dumb fuck books. Dislike. <sighs> this was a really bad one. Timmy, don't fucking cry at your father's funeral. The Bible says to be happy. How dare you, sinner? Well, there you guys have it. Uh, love God because the Bible says so. Uh, be happy because the Bible says so. And um, life has no purpose because the Bible says so, even though the Bible doesn't actually give us a purpose. This is this is great. Okay. Well, there you guys have it from Prager Pill explaining why it's hard to love God. Again, I think the real reason why it's hard to love God is because God has not made himself known in any meaningful way. And the people that claim to love God are some of the most hateful pieces of subhuman shit that I've ever actually had to deal with. Not to mention the people who claim to love God are also the least accepting of gay people, the least accepting of scientific literature, because they would prioritize their dumb little sky daddy and their silly little book of fables over meaningful, testable evidence. It's very sad.